little intro music. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, okay, you are here. I was wondering. I thought it was a good morning. Even if it's raining, we can still have good mornings, right? Uh, well, welcome, everyone, to worship at Edison. It's good to have you all here uh, this morning. Um, uh, just a couple of, of words on the service. We're going to uh, do communion the same way or very similar way that we did uh, last week. Um, and so uh, if you're coming forward to the altar, either kneeling or standing, um, you will get a little cup, uh, it's not that little, but you'll get a cup on the way up, and there will be somebody, I think, standing up here, uh, handing you the cup as you come forward. Um, as always, or as we have been uh, practicing still, if you prefer to commune in your pews, or if there are people out in the parking lot in their cars, or online, uh, and you have one of those little uh, packets, uh, communion packets with you, um, there will be a time to do that in your pew as well, and I'll address you specifically after uh, everyone else has come forward and commune. Um, so just that word about communion practice. Basically, do whatever the ushers tell you, and you will probably be fine. That's a good rule to live by. It's what I live by, and it, and it works pretty well. Uh, as far as our uh, text today, we are in uh, the book of Acts. We've been hearing readings 
from the book of Acts uh, for the last several weeks, since Easter, in fact. And uh, we are hearing uh, Peter telling a story of, of why he's, things seem to be changing in the way that the early church is carrying out their lives, why things are, are being done in a different way. He's being challenged by some people who think he has done wrong, and he is going to tell them about how God has convinced him otherwise. So uh, that's where we're going to be looking in Acts chapter 11 uh, this morning for our sermon. I think that's all of the notes that I have for you uh, ahead of time. And so uh, I would like to invite you to take a moment and to set aside the worries, the burdens uh, that you have been carrying, the anxieties that have been troubling you, to lay those aside for the moment and to prepare to hear what God has for you this morning. And I invite you to do that as we hear our prelude. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that attentive to your word, we may confess our sins receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Jesus Christ, in the mercy of God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We continue with now the feast and celebration. Let us pray. O Lord God, you command us to love you as you first loved us. Pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, that made alive by your Spirit, we may know goodness and peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, which is the, the book of Acts is the recording of the early church following the death and the resurrection of Christ. And if you've noticed, all of our lessons during Easter are, are from the book of Acts. I read from Acts 11. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. 
This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men <clears throat> came to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in the house, his house, and saying, Send a Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire house will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to, to hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then the Lord has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Word of God, word of life. Our psalm is from Psalm 148, and this is our tone. Let them praise the name of the Lord, who commanded and they were created, who made them stand fast forever and ever, giving them a law that shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind doing God's will, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world, young men and maidens, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name only is exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the people and praise for all faithful servants. The children of Israel, a people who are near the Lord. Hallelujah. Again, during the Easter season, all of our readings, our second readings, are from the book of Revelation. I read from Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Thanks. Word of God, word of life.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. First, the introduction. After washing the disciples' feet, predicting his betrayal, and then revealing his betrayer, Jesus speaks of his glorification on the cross. This deep, complicated love of Jesus by which he has mercy on his betrayers will be the distinctive mark of Jesus' community. And now the reading. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Beloved people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, if anyone should have it figured out in the first few years of the Christian church, those first decade or two after Jesus' death and resurrection, if anyone should have things figured out, it should be Peter. After all, Peter is the one who has uh, become really the leader of the disciples following Jesus' death and resurrection. He's the one who has really become something of a leader within the church, those first believers in Jesus. When Pentecost happened, for example, uh, near the beginning of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples and threw them, uh, pushed them out into the street where they began to share about what had happened with Jesus, about Jesus' death and resurrection, when they were speaking in languages that they did not know before and people from all over uh, the Roman world were hearing them speak in their own native tongue, it was Peter who stood up and spoke to everyone. It was Peter who defended his fellow disciples against the, uh, the accusations, the, the ridicule that they were facing even at that moment. It was Peter who stood up and addressed everyone with this sermon that at the end it says nearly 3,000 were added to their number. I mean, if anybody's got it figured out, if anybody knows what God is doing, what, what God is up to following Jesus' resurrection, it seems to be Peter. Peter is the one who uh, is uh, uh, healing people in Jesus' name, who is casting out demons in Jesus' name. Peter is even raising the dead in Jesus' name. Our reading from last week told that story. Peter is the one who seems to have things figured out. And so what a shock it was when even Peter was surprised by what the Holy Spirit was doing in these early days. And it wasn't a shock only to Peter, it was a shock to the rest of the church as well. And at the beginning of our reading, we see something of this shock. So here at the beginning of our reading here in Acts chapter 11, uh, we hear uh, that the apostles and the believers who were in Judea, that is the, the region around Jerusalem, they heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. That's amazing. The Gentiles have accepted the word of God. Now, in some ways, this shouldn't be a surprise. After all, uh, the the scriptures uh, from the Old Testament to the New, uh, the scriptures that they were familiar with had been promising that the Gentiles would come uh, to hear the word of God, that the Gentiles would come streaming to Jerusalem. We read this in Isaiah, near the end of Isaiah, for example. But they hear that the Gentiles have come to hear the word of God, have accepted the word of God. And more than this, they hear that Peter has gone to some of these Gentiles and he's gone in and he's eaten with them. Now to us, we hear that and we say, well, that doesn't sound like a very big deal. Uh, and, you know, of course you can go and, and eat with anyone you'd like. But, but the problem was that he went and ate with these people who were still Gentiles. 
They hadn't become Jews. They hadn't gone through uh, the uh, conversion process. They hadn't, uh, they hadn't converted to Judaism. They hadn't been circumcised as one of the major signs of this. They weren't keeping kosher laws. They had food in their household uh, that was not clean. In fact, there's a very good chance that Peter sitting and eating a meal with them meant Peter himself was in the presence of and maybe even ate unclean foods. And so when Peter re re returns to Judea, some of those believers in Judea come and they challenge Peter on this. They say, why did you go to uncircumcised men, that is to Gentiles who are not converted to Judaism, why did you go and eat with them? You should know that this isn't something we're allowed to do. The risk of contamination is simply too high. And Peter responds by telling them a story. Now, this story is told more fully in the chapter prior in Acts. So if you want to get the more detailed picture of this story, you can read Acts chapter 10. Uh, Peter's telling of it here is a little bit abbreviated. He, he cuts out some of the details. But he tells them a story about how God, about how the Holy Spirit in particular, surprised him. How the Holy Spirit in particular changed his mind. How the Holy Spirit in particular, we could even say, converted him in a manner of speaking. To understand that God was doing something among the Gentiles that he and his fellow Jews would never have guessed. That following Jesus, believing in Jesus, was not simply a, a movement within Judaism, which is what most people had assumed. Almost everyone at this point within the church was a Jew, was Jewish, and remained a Jew, right? They didn't stop being Jewish when they started following Jesus. They followed Jesus as the fulfillment of what they had always been their whole lives. But now God is doing something different among the Gentiles, not just inviting them to become Jews, that had always been allowed, but coming to them even before they had converted to Judaism, even without any expectation of them becoming Jews. So Peter tells the story, and, and the basics of the story are this. He had, he had been actually right after our reading from last week uh, where he raises uh, this, uh, this disciple named Tabitha uh, who had died. Uh, right after this, he goes uh, into a town in J named Joppa on the coast, and he is staying at the house of another Simon. Remember, Peter's original name is Simon. Uh, another Simon uh, who is a tanner. And he's staying at this house in Joppa, uh, and he's up on the roof, and he's praying. And he's uh, praying while he waits for his, his meal to be, be, be prepared. He's hungry, he's asked for dinner, and they're making dinner. And so he's sort of uh, waiting, and he's up on the roof, and he's praying. And while he's praying, he has this vision. And he describes this vision uh, to his uh, fellow believers here in Judea. In this vision, there's this large sheet that's descending from the sky. And on the sheet is every animal you can think of. Clean animals and unclean animals. Animals that are allowed to be eaten and animals that are not allowed to be eaten. And along with this sheet coming down from the heaven comes a voice. And the voice says to Peter, get up, Peter. Kill and eat. It's barbecue time. Go on out and take your pick. Maybe there's some pigs out there. I don't know what animals are on this. And Peter recoils at this. He says, wait, Lord, no. <laughs> I've never eaten anything unclean. I have always kept uh, to the law of Moses as has been handed down to us. As you commanded us, Lord, I have always been careful to observe the kosher laws. I have done everything I can to be faithful to you. Lord, by no means, I have never done this. And the answer that comes three times, as Peter says in the vision, is what God has declared clean, do not declare profane. What God has cleansed, do not treat as though it were defiled. And as Peter, uh, as is told in Acts 10, Peter, after he has this vision, uh, you know, maybe brought on by the hunger uh, that as he's waiting for dinner to be made, the smells of the food being prepared, after he has this vision, he's sitting on the roof and he has no idea what it means. He has no idea what to make of it. He's just sort of there and he says, and he's, he's, he's puzzled by it. And while he's sitting there being puzzled by this vision, the Holy Spirit says something to him. It says, Peter, there's three men. Uh, they're, coming to, they're coming for you. Uh, don't don't uh, argue with them at all. Don't resist. Just go with them. They're coming uh, to bring you somewhere, and uh, I want you to go with them. And so Peter's still not sure what's going on in this vision. 
uh, the Holy Spirit tells him to go with these three men, and sure enough, suddenly there's the three men. They arrive at the house. Now, we know, if you had read Acts 10, uh, it, it, we've already heard the story of where these men have come from. They've come from the house of a centurion named Cornelius. He's a Gentile. He's well-respected. Uh, he prays to the God of the Jews. Uh, he be, he uh, trusts in God, uh, in the, the Jewish God, the God of Israel. Uh, he gives alms to the poor. He supports the local synagogue, but he has not become a Jew himself. He has not converted. He is uh, what was sometimes referred to as a God-fearer, someone who is sort of on the outskirts of these communities. But he remains a Gentile. And he had had a vision himself where an angel showed up in his house and told him to send for this man named Simon Peter, who lives or who is staying in Joppa, and to send for him uh, and hear what he has to say. And, and so Cornelius does. And so this has happened days earlier, and the men have been on their way to Joppa, and they just arrive right after Peter has this vision. And so he goes with them, and it takes a couple more days for them uh, to arrive in uh, Caesarea, where Cornelius lives. And when they get there, uh, Cornelius tells them all about the angel, tells them all about the message, and he says, so now we're here. I've gathered my whole household, and we're ready to hear what you have to say. Now imagine uh, being shown up like that. You know, you arrive at a place, you don't really know what's going on, and they say, okay, pastor, we're ready for your sermon. Go ahead. <laughs> and so Peter starts talking, and he does pretty good, but it almost doesn't matter what he's saying, because as he says in his retelling, when I started to speak, like as soon as the word started to leave my mouth, the Holy Spirit fell on them as it fell on us in the beginning. This is Pentecost type of things. Remember the, the tongues of fire above their heads, uh, speaking in languages that they did not know beforehand. This is the sort of uh, thing he's describing, it seems. The Holy Spirit fell on these Gentiles, non-Jews, the, the whole lot of them. The Holy Spirit just fell on them, and I hadn't even really gotten to the good part of my sermon yet. And when I saw this, I realized that God has done something here that I did not expect. And as Peter says it in Acts 10, uh, who am I to withhold baptism from these people? And so they were all baptized. So this is the story of what's happened for Peter. Peter thought he understood what was happening here. Jesus was God's Messiah, promised to Israel generations before. Jesus had gone to the cross and had been raised from the dead. He had been vindicated, established as the one through whom salvation would come to Israel and to all the world. Peter was a Jew, and he knew himself to be a Jew, a faithful Jew. And he knew Jesus to be a faithful Jew. And he thought following Jesus meant also becoming a faithful Jew. Jew. Most of the church at this point thought be following Jesus meant becoming a faithful Jew. And then the combination of this vision of God clean, uh, declaring clean that which uh, Peter had thought was defiled, and these men showing up, and the Holy Spirit falling on these Gentiles convinced him that something new was happening here. It wasn't a scandal that God would go to Gentiles. It was a scandal that God would welcome Gentiles into the church as Gentiles, not as converted Jews. Now, sometimes when we read this, this story of this conversation between Peter and uh, these, these believers, fellow believers who have, are, are challenging him on what he's done uh, I think we kind of read into it some divisions that aren't really there in the text, that weren't there in the, at the time. We sort of read this as, you know, narrow-minded Judaism, maybe. Narrow-minded Pharisees who, who think only their nation is the one who counts. And they're sort of, you know, maybe something like racist against the Gentiles or something like that. And they don't like that these other people that are different from them are being welcomed. That they're sort of angry at Peter for being too inclusive or something like that. But I think a better reading of what's going on here is that these are believers who are faithfully wrestling with what God is doing. They are trying to be faithful to God as they have known God their entire lives. And when something happens that's outside of this, they question it, right? They come to Peter, they challenge him, but they don't, you know, drive him out. They say, why did you do this? And Peter explains it. And what's their reaction when Peter explains it? When they heard this, they were, uh, our NRSV says silence, but really just quiet. When they heard this, they were quiet, and they praised God, saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles, as Gentiles, the repentance that leads to life. Wow. 
That's right. They say, wow, right? That's what they do. That's exactly right. There's just, uh, they marvel, right? They've been wrestling with this. They're not hostile to Gentiles. They thought Peter had, had messed up. They thought Peter was, was losing his commitment or something. But they find out that no, God is doing something that none of them expected. This is wrestling within the Christian community, which there is no distinction between Jew and Christian at this point. Not really. Uh, Christianity in the, in the many decades to come after the Jerusalem temple is destroyed by the Romans after an uprising, uh, there will be, Christianity will become primarily a Gentile phenomenon. But at this time, it's, it's Jewish. And it turns out that to follow Jesus, to be a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus transcends all other national or ethnic or even religious boundaries. That Judaism, that being a Jew and following Jesus is not in the, in the final analysis any different from being a Gentile and following Jesus. That faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in what Jesus has done, believing in that promise is what matters. As Paul says it in one of his letters, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything. Neither of them matter, one way or the other. A new creation is everything. It is God's new creation, God's new thing being done in Jesus that leads the church forward. Now, they will continue to wrestle. They will continue to disagree. They will continue to argue about it. If you read in Acts, you'll see uh, there's a big meeting a few chapters later uh, where they're, they're still wrestling with this same question because more and more Gentiles are becoming believers. It's not just an isolated instance in Caesarea, and they're not quite sure what to do about it, and they keep wrestling with it. And honestly, they keep wrestling with it after the New Testament ends, right? They're still wrestling with that question. It's continuing to be a question that they are wrestling with, and they'll continue to wrestle with it. We're continuing to wrestle with this question. Maybe not the particulars as they're stated here, but the question of what God is up to, what God is doing. Is the Holy Spirit showing up in non-Lutheran churches? Yes, right? I hope the Holy Spirit's not confined to Lutheran churches, right? I, that's not the case. Is the Holy Spirit showing up among peoples that we wouldn't even necessarily identify as Christian? Yeah, the Holy Spirit might be doing that too. The Holy Spirit might be calling us uh, to speak to people, to preach to people, to deliver these promises to people who do not and never will look anything like Scandinavian religion as we know it, right? God's not only Norwegian, it turns out, <laughs> right? One of the times I was very, uh, 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 I don't know if I'd call this a Peter experience, but uh, a time when I was, my eyes were open to the sorts of things that God was doing happened when I was in seminary at one point. And uh, Luther Seminary, so in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, one of its uh, uh, strengths is it had a strong outreach to international students, especially from Africa. So there were often uh, students from, from various uh, nations within Africa uh, who were there, who were studying, who were working on PhDs, that sort of thing. And I remember hearing from one of them who was from, I believe, Cameroon. I might be wrong on the nation. Um, and he was talking about how uh, African churches were sending missionaries to the United States. He was talking about how African churches were sending people to come and join white English-speaking churches in the United States to bring some spirit back to us, right? Because we had given it to them so far long before in the centuries past, and now they want to come and revitalize us as well. And, and as you look around the world and you think about the future of the Christian church and of Lutheranism even in particular, if you look just by the numbers, you know, most Lutherans or, or close to most Lutherans live in Africa. I don't know if you knew that. The largest nations uh, as far as number of Lutherans, uh, are the top three, so Germany's in there, you, you'd guess that, although I'm not sure what the actual attendance is like. Uh, but then it's Tanzania and it's Nigeria. Those are number, uh, actually I think number one and number three now. Uh, in, in the worldwide Lutheranism. Indonesia has a large population of Lutherans. India has a large population of Lutherans. Uh, Madagascar is very influential among global Lutherans. Uh, even when we feel like our churches are aging and shrinking, the Holy Spirit is still out there working and revitalizing and even sending missionaries to re-evangelize us. And boy, do we need it. Boy, am I happy to receive it. The Holy Spirit will not be bound 
by anything we try and bind the Holy Spirit with. The Holy Spirit goes out there, and the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit delivers Jesus to people. The Holy Spirit raises up churches, even churches we wouldn't necessarily recognize as churches. And continues to gather them around the gospel. The gospel that had so much life 2,000 years ago and has so much life today. The Holy Spirit is at work and will continue working. And thanks be to God for that. Amen. Amen. Let us conf confess the faith of the church using the words of the Nicene Creed. We, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. God who leads us, send us your spirit, inspire us to faithfully wrestle with the important issues of the day, and guide us to follow your leading rather than our own prejudices or desires. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creating God, all creation gives you praise. Open us up to re perceive this song of praise which surrounds us and move us to join in the song. 
Fill us with awe and wonder at the beauty of the world you have entrusted to us and make us faithful stewards of the earth's abundance. God, in your mercy. God of all nations, humble the rulers of all peoples before your splendor. Direct them to care for the people who are the most vulnerable and restrain them when they overstep their bounds. Bring an end to the Russian aggression in Ukraine and hold accountable Putin and all who enable him. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of love, teach us to live according to your commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. Convict us where our love is cold and renew us by your word of mercy. Bring an end to racism and all divisions which prevent love from flourishing in our churches that we might more effect- effectively glorify you. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We also lift before you these people in situations we name either aloud or in our hearts. For my uh, cousin Jennifer Anderson, whose father passed away this last week. God, in your mercy. For the family of Jenny Groves, who also recently passed away. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also Also with you. you. (laughs) Share a sign of peace with one another. Peace. Peace. Let us pray. Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with the great thanksgiving. 
resurrection, broke the bonds of sin and death, and gave life to all creation. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, as I said, we receive communion uh, either kneeling or standing up front at the altar rail, and you'll get a cup as you come forward. Or if you are communing in your pews or in your seats, wherever those are, uh, uh, you, I will address you at the end, um, and you can use those uh, little communion uh, packets. Uh, but all are welcome to come and receive Jesus Christ truly present here for the forgiveness of your sin. Give Christ, give him to you.
Now, for those who are uh, communing in your pews or in your seats, if you take out that, that piece of bread and hold that up in front of you, this is the body of Christ given for you. You may eat the bread. And likewise with the cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. You may drink the cup. And now a blessing for you and for all. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you now and forever in his faith and grace and mercy for you. Amen. Amen. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, first announcement is uh, there is a joint uh, scholarship that is uh, administered mostly by Burlington Lutheran, but we participate in it, the Einer and Ruby Knutson's College Scholarship. Uh, the deadline for that application is today. Uh, it's been advertised the last couple of weeks, so if, that, if there's somebody who's hoping to apply to it that needs to be in uh, to uh, Burlington Lutheran today, uh, it can be via email, um, or you can send it to our email as well, but it goes there. Uh, and then, um, let's see. Oh, there's a notice on the back. There's a couple of uh, uh, some different kinds of furniture uh, if you that are being given away by people uh, connected to members of the congregation. So uh, there's descriptions of a couple there. If, uh, if there's something there that uh, you are interested in, um, you can uh, contact uh, either the church office or the person who's listed there uh, for that. Um, other announcements that need to be made. Oh, yes. Um, the uh, confirmation kids are running a food drive. Um, and so uh, you'll notice there's a table on the back out there. So if you have some uh, non-perishable goods um, that you would like to donate to that. Is there a deadline on that, Carrie? Throughout May. Yeah, so anytime during the month of May to bring uh, food in. And there's that table on the way to the, to the fellowship hall in the narthex here. And you can just dr- deposit things there. Any other announcements that I'm forgetting that I should make? All right, last thing I, I want to say is just a word about COVID, which I know we all want a word about COVID, don't we? Um, I, just be aware, you know, we're, I'm paying attention to, uh, uh, other of our leaders are paying attention to uh, the way that the, the numbers are going uh, currently, and there is a surge being experienced. It's not, it doesn't seem to be significantly increasing hospitalizations at this point, um, but we're keeping an eye on things. Uh, so just know that we are keeping an eye on things. If we get to what the CDC calls high hospitalizations levels, we may uh, make some decisions regarding mask wearing again for a period of time, temporary period of time. At this point, we're still in low. We're not anywhere near high yet, but just know that we're paying attention to that and you know we're just following this as it goes. The good news is this variant seems to be causing less severe illness than other ones have. Uh, pray for that trend to continue. The virus can just keep getting less deadly and more contagious, so we all have immunity to it. That'd be great. Um, but, uh, you know, pray, these are things to pray for. But just know that we are paying attention to that um, and will continue to. Uh, you know, in the meantime, uh, you know, we're continuing to make things live streamable. So uh, if being here in person is becomes something that you're too worried about, it's okay to participate online. Uh, there, I don't know if there are still, there may still be some people who are tuning in in their cars with the FM transmitter, which we do keep running uh, still, even now. Um, or uh, seating in the narthex uh, is also a possibility as well. So, um, you know, continue to, to make the decisions that make sense to you. You can evaluate your own uh, sense of safety um, and risk, risk level there. So just a word about that. Uh, you know, it feels like a, a long marathon, except now it's feeling like an ultra marathon, you know, where you go 100 miles instead of just 26 miles. So, uh, but, uh, you know, we keep on running and uh, we run in the strength of, of God who, who strengthens us. And that's what we have. Uh, I think all I have left for you, well, that's all that I have left for you. So what God has for you is a blessing. Uh, so stand and receive God's blessing for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.